Good afternoon, Club 17. It's great to be here today. Nice to see so many people in the room. And we're going to get going, and we have a little competition. That's okay. I can speak loudly. Uh, we're going to get going. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Carl Kappas is going to lead us in the invocation and four-way test. Let us pray. Almighty God, we invite you to our meeting today. We thank you for the many blessings that you continue to bestow on us. We ask for your blessing and protection on the folks that are eating and working in this room today and those joining us on Zoom. We ask that you give comfort to those who mourn, strength to those that need it, and healing to those that are sick and hurting. We thank you and praise you for the many contributions that we have celebrated this week of International Women's Day. May those contributions continue to be recognized and rewarded more and more. We ask that you continue to guide us in all we think, say, and do. And may you continue to be within us to refresh us, around us to protect us, before us to guide us, above us to bless us, and beneath us to hold us up. Amen. And now let's repeat the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And we have a number of visitors and prospective members with us today. And if you would just please stand for a minute as I mentioned your name. First of all, Rick Flynn has brought Sparkle Worley from DePaul Cristo Ray High School. Welcome. And Amanda Forsey has brought Michelle Edwards from uh, Savista Bank. Uh, Michelle is a member of the Cincinnati Eastside Rotary Club. Welcome, Michelle. And Nancy Reese has brought Donna Kastner. She's a retired entrepreneur, and she's a Rotarian from the Rotary Club of Hudson, Ohio. Welcome, Donna. And Rick Flynn has been busy, because he has also brought Siobhan Taylor from DePaul Cristo Ray High School. Welcome, Siobhan. And he's brought John Walters from First Commonwealth Bank. Thank, John, thanks for joining us. And thanks to all who've brought guests and prospective members. We appreciate it. And we have a number of announcements today. First of all, just a reminder, when you're finished eating your lunch, if you'd please put your mask back on. We continue to follow all the right protocols. And we have several birthdays to celebrate this week. March 9th, Mark Jaconetti. March 10th, David Freeman and Brent Seelmeyer. March 12th, Steve Rogers. And March 15th, John Farmeyer. Let's wish them all a happy birthday. Now, uh, I know that people get a number of emails, but I will tell you that the e-raise that you get every Tuesday is a really important document. And the reason is, it's a great reference and also has a number of needed items if you want to participate in club activities. So I'm going to direct you to something that was an e-raise and just say how excited I am about this new campaign we're running called Save Local Slash Believe to Achieve. This is a program that we're joining in with 3CDC on Save Local, but we're giving it our own twist. Because if you 
pick a restaurant or other local business that you'd like to buy a gift card from. You can buy a gift card up to $100 and our Rotary Club will match it uh, with the same gift card from the same merchant or restaurant. Uh, if you do that during the month of March, uh, we'll, we have the matching program going on and we have up to $15,000 in club funds that we'll use for the match. This is a great way to support local merchants and we know how hard they've been hit over the past year and it has been a year now exactly is what I hear. Uh, and it's a great way also to support three local charities that will be the beneficiaries of our Believe to Achieve silent auction. And they are the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Cincinnati, Stepping Stones for Camp Allen, and Visionaries and Voices. So this is a wonderful way to support local businesses, a wonderful way to support three great charities. And if you go to E-Raise and click on the form, it has all the information you need. Uh, you, you just fill it out and send it in with the gift card to the Rotary office and the office will do the match. And if, it's, uh, if you would prefer to just donate some money to the program and, and not go get the gift card, that's fine too. Uh, just let the office know and they will match that. They will pick a merchant and match it. And for those who are really good at social media, and I put myself somewhere in the middle of the spectrum on that, why don't you post it to your personal Facebook account? It's a great way for many to see what Rotary is doing. And also, if you send the photo to our club office, it'll get posted on our club's Facebook account. So, great program. And for those who were part of the meeting last week, you heard the announcement that we've got a great event coming up. It's in the center field pavilion at the stadium to see the Reds versus the Brewers on May 21st at 7, 10 p.m. Each ticket includes a dinner buffet and a private indoor seating area with access to an outdoor deck. The buffet has great foods, hot dogs, hamburgers, brats, uh, you name it, and of course, peanuts and popcorn, uh, bottles of uh, bottled water and soft drinks, complimentary are part of the ticket, as well as two beer tickets, and all for $95. So if you'd like to be part of that fun event, just uh, send, let the Rotary office know by May 14th. Um, and we've got some great news about some of our members. Uh, Dr. Zaria Davis has been selected into a new position in the Cincinnati Chamber's Leadership Cincinnati Class 44. Congratulations to Zaria. And another member of our club, David Ahrens, has announced that his firm, CR Architecture, has added three new offices. What a great thing to see in the midst of an economy that's coming back. And next week's speaker, we're privileged to have Justice Pat DeWine from the Supreme Court of Ohio. And now I'd like to talk about today's program. Unfortunately, Barbara Turner uh, from Ohio National Financial Services was going to speak, but a conflict came up and she could not join us. But we're very pleased to have Paula Brem Heger, who is the director of the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Libraries. And Paula, if you give me a minute, it's good to see you up on the screen. I want to say a few words of introduction to the club, but you can, you can fill in the rest. Um, Paula is, as I said, the director of the libraries. She has a focus on expanding access, community and civic engagement innovation, and she is a strong and passionate advocate for public libraries. Uh, she oversees the, our community's 41 library locations, including in that, the ma downtown main library. And that system serves 800,000 people. And prior to that, she held other leadership positions at the library here. She's currently a member of the Ohio Library Council's Board of Directors. She has been the president of the Young Adult Library Services Association and many other leadership roles. Uh, she also is heavily involved in commu other community organizations. And she did receive the Urban Library Council's Joey Roger Leadership Award in 2014 
and graduated from the Harvard Kennedy School of Emerging Leaders Executive Education Program. Uh, there's more that I could say. I will also just mention that uh, Paula has written extensively. Uh, she's a graduate of three very familiar educational institutions, having her BA from the University of Cincinnati, her Master of Library Science from Indiana New University, and her Master of Public Affairs from Northern Kentucky University, where she was named the Distinguished MPA graduate for the 2016 program. She's worked in libraries in different parts of the country for the past 25 years, but has returned home to her native Cincinnati. Uh, Paula, we are thrilled to have you speak to us today at the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. And what I'd like to do today is give you a quick, well, give you an update on part of our facilities master plan. So the library, and I saw some chats giving a shout out to the library. You know, the library uh, has gone through a lot in the last year, but we continue to move forward with our, our facilities planning. As noted in the introduction, we do have several facilities throughout Hamilton County. We are a city county system. All in, it's about a million square feet of public space. So while we have a number of projects and there are two branch projects, which time permitting, I may try to do a little bit of a re review of those two uh, renovations that are opening this year. The primary thing I want to raise some awareness about uh, with such a distinguished group, and this is the second time I've had the chance to talk to the Rotary Club. I really appreciate the invitation. I think you're such a great group. Um, individually love talking with you and you do so much great work for our community. So I'm so pleased. And I will do my best to go through a fairly long presentation that we have offered to the public and to stakeholders in a couple of different formats over the last month to two months, and then some time at the end. But today's presentation will be primarily focused on concepts around our main library. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here, hoping I can do that. Okay, hoping everybody can see that. You're all probably aware of our main library. It's a very large facility here uh, on Vine Street between 8th and Court Street. What you see here is a rendering because we have been working with various architects and urban planners to look at the main library and possibly renovate it with a heavy focus on the external plazas, initially the Vine Street Plaza. So you can see some words around here. We have such a big set of buildings, such a large campus, and we are really looking at the way people interact with information and technology. You may know we have a maker space in our North building. You can see we have Create. That's a huge area that is used by businesses and entrepreneurs. We also have a lot of people that come in and connect. And we have plans to make collaboration even a larger part of what we're doing with various kinds of meeting spaces. So all of these plans and the facilities master plan, which is available on our webpage, it's a 10 year plan to renovate and reinvigorate our system across the county. But the main library is a huge piece of that. It's a, it's a crown jewel. And as we go through this, we also know that it has a real significant place in the development of our city in general, right along Vine Street. So this is just a little bit to remind everyone, all of these designs are conceptual, pending further review. We do have additional levy dollars that were um, provided for this project primarily, courtesy of uh, the generous support of our community. The 2018 levy, one mill levy, yes vote, which has allowed us to move forward with this kind, uh, this kind of a project. So we have a new brand, you'll see that around. Many of you know our signs, we've had the red branding for some time, but to refresh and look at things a little bit with new eyes, we do have some brand updates here. I'm not gonna get into that too much, but just so you're aware, and if you see this reflected 
as we move through it. It may look different and that's because we have done some reimagining of our brand and our outward facing and refreshing around that. So, you know, we have a continuum of how people interact with information. When I was a kid, I think about the main library, it's a great example. You would come in and information was housed and stored. You had physical print things to uh, require to figure out where the information was. And you really interacted with that in information rather individually. But now we know that people have a different relationship to information and learning and knowledge that has really evolved. There are still some individual elements in that, obviously, but there's space, there's experience, there's collaboration. So many of the buildings that we have, which have served us so well, were designed in an era when information itself really didn't require the kind of supports that we see in today's world. So keeping that in mind, again, that 2020 facilities master plan, it's, it's a recommendation for a major renovation of the main library. So there are several different phases along that. And what we're talking about today are some of the earlier conceptual phases with an emphasis on Vine Street. If you had attended any of the sessions that we did mostly in 2019 um, throughout the community, although we are still having virtual Q&A sessions on the facilities master plan, you may have seen some of these renderings where we are also talking about possibly repurposing Walnut Street, if that's housing or retail or an atrium, that is not, it's not that we're not going to do that. It's just that that may not be in the earlier phase when we talk about the concepts that we discussed today. So what we did in February is we, we reviewed these concepts with our board, with our staff, with stakeholders. And some of you may have attended some of those meetings. So I apologize if this is a, a rehash, but it's a lot of information. So seeing it twice, and I've seen it multiple times, has really allowed me to think through things differently. Again, not just about the library, but as about our city overall and the way that Vine Street and some of those elements are so important and we're really rediscovering them. I know in the introduction there was mention about how important local businesses are. All of that is just essential that we keep that in mind. We are trying to keep that in mind, how we can support those things. So obviously the services are important, but the development and the library being a part of that continuum from the banks on up through OTR is also an essential element of that. So just to think through it, this is a very helpful slide that we've used several times. I actually have a poster of this in my, in my office. We do have all of those branches and they are important. We're putting dollars into them with a heavy emphasis on accessibility because we have some very old buildings. The average age of a building says it had been renovated or built in our system was 43 years. And some of them are 80, 90, 100 plus years old and they were not handicap accessible. So some of our branch projects are really focused on those elements of accessibility and improvements that are essential. Well, if you look at this, you can see all of our branches combined they uh, make up about 47% of our overall public space. And the main library alone makes up more than a half. So obviously the main library is a major resource for the library and for our community and requires attention and careful thought. If you look at what we're talking about, we have some major maintenance elements that we have to do. On this, you will see that we are noting the elevator repair and also a skylight repair. If you've been at the main library, you, you are familiar with our skylight and the skylight is a very cool element, um, but it does leak to be quite, quite frank. The design is kind of from another era. It wasn't necessarily designed with maintenance in mind. So sometimes when I would come into work, the plants in our atrium were moved around because they were designed to catch some of the water or if we had a heavy snow that would sit on that skylight. So we're gonna make that a much more functional element. And the elevators also are older and require updating for a variety of reasons. So those are basic things that will be happening. But when we talk about the higher level design, we want to think about how we're not just doing maintenance, but really taking a fresh look at the building to do these things about improved connectivity, inclusivity, and safety, make it a welcoming, inclusive space. So the main library, this is a, an old, older picture of Shillitoe's, and the main library was originally designed in the era of 
the um, department store. So it has sort of the same kind of feel where things were really in a department store subject model. That's how things retail and services were designed. The main library came out of this thinking, it's very much a building of its time. And again, it has served us well, uh, but that's not necessarily the experience that we need for a big information center today. If you are familiar with the building, I have highlighted here the 1953 building, that was the original building. And then it was built out from there. The larger building here, if you can see my cursor, it was actually built and completed in the late 70s, I think 1978. And um, then we went across the street with the larger North building, which was 1997. So it is a phased building. And the 1953 building was the original. And I, I imagine many of you know that. And also, I can't remember if we have a slide about that, but just a little bit of a side note. Um, the original entrance to the building was actually off of 8th Street. So if you have a chance and you're out walking around or if you're out in the spring weather, if it's not raining when you head back, if you're in the ballroom today, you can see the original entrance along 8th Street. It's just interesting to think about how the city once was and where the library was originally built and how it looked and worked in that 1950s model. So we have, um, oops. So this is just first floor, second floor, third floor. If you've been in here, and I imagine most of you have, you know we have three open floors that include a mix of technology and collections and services. We do have a couple of closed floors. If you stand in the atrium and you look up, you would see the closed storage floors. So it's actually a five-story building. It's also important to note that the library was built with um, some subterranean spaces. So we have a number of staff who work still in the basement of our south building. So you can see on this diagram that there are two stack areas below the ground level. And that's worth noting when we talk about Vine Street, because if you are on the Vine Street Plaza, underneath there are additional work areas. So when we talk about updating the Vine Street Plaza, there are several things that we have to keep in mind, including the fact that there are subterranean areas there that have to be dealt with. Over the years, uh, they have had some water invasion and other maintenance issues. So all of those things contribute to why now is the time to look at reimagining all of that space, particularly the plaza area. Uh, this is a little bit, we're just gonna go right past this because I don't wanna take too much time on the specifics, but we are talking about the North building here being um, in the new concept where we double down on the technology. That is currently where we have our maker space. And in the pandemic for ease of use, we have also made that first floor, which had been the earlier children's department, we have converted that into a heavy technology space and are moving some of our other collections out of there so that the North building is really heavy technology, whereas the South building is a larger area where we can have what we're kind of calling a multi-generational branch, a very robust service that mirrors a little bit more what you see when you go to the branches, but on a much higher, more intense level. So this is just a cross section that brings forward that concept of what it might look like, which includes the Ninth Street Bridge, one of my favorite spots in the library. And just the idea that that would be where we would have more of our technology and our assistance for people who need that technology, both basic as well as higher level maker technology. During the pandemic, we have really spent a lot of time helping people across that spectrum. In the beginning, it was basic needs, copies, faxing, faxing to places that were closed. But now as we've gone through a transition, we are seeing more and more folks who wanna come in and use our maker space as they try to restart or enhance their business service offerings or pivot and learn new skills. When we talk about the other building, we are talking about service and space that might look again, more like a library that you would walk in across the county at one of our branches. Heavy service for kids and, and young people, spaces to be together, spaces to work individually, spaces for quiet reflection, all of that kind of moved into that South building as well. And then the idea that we would also have enhanced opportunities for gathering and collaboration. We are already hearing from a lot of folks 
that they believe after the pandemic, if people continue to work at home, this idea of having an opportunity to come someplace where they can be alone together, perhaps a very small meeting room at the main library, individual study rooms will become even more important or the ability to meet with two or three people here and collaborate by Zoom with people from somewhere else in the country or internationally at a library uh, meeting room that has that kind of technology easily accessible and built in. We also are talking about special destinations. We could do an entire presentation on the amazing special collections we have here and our Cincinnati collection. That's an important element of what we're doing. We have continued to digitize that, uh, those elements of the collection that we can. How do we bring people into that and make that accessible as well? And then on the first floor, the easy grab and go kinds of things, elements that you want to be able to see, walk in, walk out, that kind of thing at your lunch hour or right when you're heading home from work, or if you're in the neighborhood, stop by on a Saturday afternoon, but you don't just walk through and see what's there. Also convenience of grabbing holds, uh, things you have in reserve and leaving, keeping all of that in mind when we look at a redesign. So the uh, this is again, a little bit too much detail maybe for today, but that, that uh, skylight I mentioned, we are redesigning now with a focus on making sure light continues to be brought in, that it's sustainable, and it's a little bit more of a modern design. So we continue to look at what the options are for that. These are the floors cross section, but you'll notice in this particular cross section, there is a stair. So if you come to our main library and you're new to the library, or even if you know the library, one thing we know is true is it can be a little bit more uh, disorienting. It's a building that doesn't necessarily indicate how you get from the first floor to the second floor. There's not a very easy intuitive wayfinding when you enter that large atrium space. So we always try our best to help people, but walking in, it's not entirely clear how to navigate it. Many large urban libraries have had this uh, challenge. And one thing that many of them have done, which we are hoping we will be able to uh, fund is the idea of a stair so that you can easily use the elevator. And you can see in this particular picture, the idea that the elevator is offset, visual cue, that's where the elevator bank is. We have more than one, but this is the primary elevator bank that many people use, but also a social stair that comes right up, possibly all the way to the third floor, depending. I will also um, note, and if you've heard me talk, I, I do mention this, that atrium space, was really designed for a very large card catalog and it worked fantastically. I used to come down with my dad all the time when I was a kid and had to do a big project. We'd walk in and you'd get the drawer out of the card catalog and there were tables and you would find what you needed. But that element of library service really doesn't exist anymore, though the architectural space was designed around that as a concept. So the idea that we would find new and innovative ways to fill that space that activate this first floor again in a robust way. That's kind of what you're seeing with this concept around the beginning of a larger stair and then a stair that really helps you understand how to get from one floor to the next and that there are multiple floors. Uh, you can see the concept we have come in discovery, then there's the collection which remains an essential part of the library's offerings and thinking about gathering or meeting rooms perhaps on the third floor. So that's kind of an overview of the interior. This is a super fast review of things. I do want to leave time for questions, but I definitely want to talk about the exterior of the library. This is a picture you all may recognize. This is Vine and Ninth Street. So you see the South Building, the larger building, the North Building, and then that bridge that I was talking about right in the middle there. If you know the library, you know that we have a elevated plaza. And so, the library itself is kind of tucked away behind the plaza on Vine Street on one side, and then the, the wall that surrounds the garden on the other side of Vine. So it's not always clear uh, or visible in the way that many buildings now are designed to be to connect to the outside. It's a very internal facing building in many ways. So we're just trying to think about how we can integrate the Vine Street Plaza with the rest of the building, and perhaps just as importantly, the rest of the cityscape, the street and the traffic outside. Um, I'll talk in a minute, you know, Court Street, if you've been down here, Court Street is being redesigned to be 
pedestrian friendly. Fine Street really bringing it down to grade, as you see in this rendering, and offering more visibility to the inside of the library. That's what we're picturing as a vision moving forward. We want people to know it's a library, understand that it's an exciting, vibrant place to be, see that plaza is a place that's welcoming, inviting, and active, and also the idea of transparency, which has been one of our guiding principles, is something we would like to see more reflected in the physical nature of the building. So again, looking at this as one plaza across 9th Street, because that's really what it, what it could be if it were not so separated by some of those elements like the wall or the elevation. Um, also then it would give us the opportunity to highlight parts of the building. This is, uh, some of you may remember, I can't, I think maybe it was four or five years ago, there was like for National Poetry Month, many of the buildings in downtown had different parts of a poem on them. You can see that's here on the corner, things like that that activate the building. We would love to have more of an opportunity to do that sort of activation. I uh, talked about these planning principles. You'll see transparency right there. And then when we look at outside of the library, we also want to keep in mind other principles, including this list. Our board of trustees reviewed this presentation in February and kind of gave their input on what their priorities would be. And obviously safe goes right along with welcoming and inviting. So these are related, but you can see a very, I think, coherent idea of a flexible, inclusive space, sustainable, vibrant art, um, and that's focused on the community and making it welcoming and, and a, a feeling of safe and inviting space. These are some quick slides that really give you a larger view of where the library sits along what is a backbone of downtown, that's Vine Street. Some libraries in other cities are not so fortunate as us. They don't sit right in the heart of the development area or the corridor that is so important, really acting as a meridian for us, but we're right there in the heart of it. So we have this fantastic opportunity to activate as the rest of the city activates and to be a real part of that excitement that we all know is building and has been for some time. The central business district is right there. These are the two sort of ends of what we think about a little bit for us uh, with the library located right along there. Again, a little bit more of an idea, Washington Park, Hyatt Park across the way. You can see that it is really a design for the city center and the backbone that we need to be a part of. And, and we're really excited about that opportunity to be um, a gem along this sort of necklace that runs through our city. And, and that's what we are. These are some renderings of that Court Street. I was just down there. These are already out of date. They're really making progress. Um, but if you've been involved in that project or are aware of that project, it's a big focus again on accessibility, visibility, activation, and pedestrian use of that street. The Vine Street Corridor here, this is where we are. That North Garden I talked about, Vine Street. We do have the Walnut Street Plaza. And while that's not part of the discussion today, Again, it's simply at a later phase. It's also worth noting that we do have some outdoor spaces that you may or may not be entirely aware of. The Reading Garden over here on 8th is one of my favorites. And there are some uh, balcony spaces that occasionally we use for special events, but if there's a possibility perhaps to activate them or at least bring the outdoor feeling to some spaces people are in the building, that's another element that we would really like to have the opportunity to expand on. This is a Vine Street, the existing conditions there. You can see the plaza. You all may be familiar with these elements, but we do have that elevated area. Um, sometimes I think of it a little bit like Fountain Square used to be when you would walk by the old Fountain Square with the fountain right out front. It was a slightly different feeling than it is now with the change and the ability to really see what's going on and the activation of that space. So similarly, if you have the opportunity now to walk by, you would note that when you look at the library, you, you just generally don't see the library as much as maybe would be ideal. You sort of see this large landscaped area and it's kind of unclear what's going on at the plaza. There are some ramps here and there that are not entirely obvious how to use them. The other thing that some of our urban planners have astutely noted, if you're driving down Vine Street, because of the position of the library, 
by the time you realize you're at the library, you may be past the library. So that visibility is something that can be confusing to people in a variety of ways. Uh, this is just some further explore, exploration of that. And also that the entrance right now is on a very kind of tucked away corner. It's a corner that's heavily shaded and it's a pretty narrow entrance. If you were to look at the Walnut Street, it is not that kind of an entrance. It has much more openness. You can move how you'd like to move, but Vine Street kind of funnels everybody into one space, which is not ideal for urban planning or for that feeling of welcome, welcomeness, because there are a lot of people in that area. It just requires work. If you have a stroller or you have a walking device that you need, it's hard to maneuver sometimes in that space. Um, so this is just an idea of what we might see as some opportunities, including the North Plaza, uh, bringing some technology or some makerspace out there, having some public plaza at grade, and then maybe even moving the entrance out of that, that tucked in corner. So not only is everything more open, there's not this feeling of the entrance is at the corner and requires you to sort of maneuver toward it. When we think about the plaza, these are some renderings of other public plazas that have a focus on art or activity that um, our planning partners have brought forward to us. They are in no way something we've decided on, but you can see how vibrant these public places are and they provide an opportunity for some standing sculpture, as well as bringing the library outside or having programs or activities right on that plaza and really, again, activating the space. Some other ideas that could be more quiet, um, again, reading, movable furniture that come out when we're open, move back in when we're closed, some activities that are sculptures that also have activity involved in them, or you could just have some areas outside where people can be a part of a program at the library as we're having it and moving it around. The idea that there would be some landscaping of some nature, again, keeping in mind welcoming, safe and inclusive, but making that space maybe not quite as concrete focused as it is right now. These are some very, very general renderings, but one thing you'll notice in them as concepts, tying together the two elements of Vine Street, instead of having them feel so separate that they come across Ninth Street and then would ideally tie into Court Street and right up Vine, but it, that it's part of the overall feel as you move along Vine Street, and you can see that as you start to approach OTR if you're walking or driving along Vine. The idea that some we would have perhaps some larger sculpture to offset it, again, give a visual view. And here you can see in this rendering, the at-grade concept that would allow us to have more visibility in the building. If you come in the building, we have a mezzanine area that has a ramp, some other things that, again, it's, it's not clear to people, I think, all the time, how to interact with that or where it goes. So bringing it all down and having it be visually clear would really help people, I think, feel like they can come in the library and understand how to use it. These are just some other general proposed visions, some ideas around that. Um, having the terrace possibly up on 8th Street, or we have a small terrace that actually is over Vine Street, reinforce the design there um, and have it feel more open and visible as well. These are just some ideas if we could activate that third floor terrace, what they might look like as well. Um, and it's about 1.10. Uh, Linda and the organizers today did recommend that I leave a few minutes for questions. So I can take questions on this now. And then if we have time, I can do a quick couple of slides on our Price Hill and Deer Park projects. But just in case we don't get to them, I do wanna note that those are both projects at our branches that are significant renovations and expansions of some existing buildings and facilities that will be opening this year. So that is my major presentation. Um, I can stop sharing that. And if you have questions, happy to answer them. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Paula. Uh, very good. And I'm sure we have questions and I just wanna say this to the people in the room. If you want to ask a question, I'll have to repeat it through the microphone so that everybody can hear it, including Paula. And uh, if you're on Zoom, please text me your question as always, and, and I will uh, raise that to Paula. So let's, let's go ahead and get started.
Okay, uh, Brad, go ahead. The question really is about the Deer Park branch. What are the plans for that and when people can expect to see the changes? Well, because that is a, such a great question and I love to talk about our projects, how about I go ahead and do the quick overview. I'll do a slide or two on Price Hill and then we'll get right to Deer Park. So the two projects and the, and the question is about the second project here, but I do wanna know Price Hill which is uh, one of our oldest branches. It's more than 100 years old, had never been significantly renovated or updated. We are renovating that building. So the Carnegie remains adding on. So it'll be about twice the size, honoring the original space and then doing some additional work. These are pictures. If you have not been to Price Hill or driven by this library, do yourself a favor if you're out this weekend and looking for something to do, please do because it is opening very soon. And we have here some facts about that. We have about $7 million investment there. It will be fully accessible. So it is one of our branches that prior to this project, if you couldn't get up the steps, you couldn't get in the building. So that has all changed. It will have an elevator. Um, it has expanded to over 13,000 square feet. We'll have two large meeting rooms, several small study rooms, and then some designated areas. We have more than double the computer and laptop capacity. Right now, the opening is tentatively scheduled, well, it's pretty much solidly scheduled for um, the second week of April and more details will come. That is our first project, but I think the question, which is about our Deer Park, existing Deer Park branch library. So our Deer Park branch is one of our smallest branches. We currently have, I'm, I'm looking at my poster to confirm, I believe we have six libraries that are less than 5,000 square feet, Deer Park, was one of them. So we have a very small library. I think it is just over 4,000 square feet in the Dillonvale Shopping Mall. You can see here, this is the Dillonvale Shopping Center. So it kind of straddles Deer Park and Dillonvale. When we were out there for our community engagement, which was a great session. So if there's anybody from Deer Park, let me just say thank you again. We had a very large turnout, much larger than the small library could have accommodated. So we did do that in a nearby school. And we had a number of recommendations for where we might look for a new space that was more accessible and larger. One of them was the TJ Maxx space at the Dillon Vale Shopping Center. The TJ Maxx had left and the space was available. So we did pursue that, it was a great tip. We are moving into that. And you can see this is the, um, this is the outside of that when we first started and some of the inside. So it's a big area that is right down the way. We're, we're really calling this more of a renovation than a change because it's literally in the same shopping center. And you can see that here where we are located and where we're moving. This is the exterior of the space and then interior. So we are well into design and we have started the construction there. This is an overview of what's going on if you've been to the current Deer Park, it's going to be a fantastic expansion. We'll have a quiet room, flexible study pods, a community room, which we're hoping may be accessible even possibly outside of branch operating hours. We'll see how that goes. We have designated areas for the different um, audiences that we would be serving. These are some renderings of what that branch will uh, kind of provide. You can see that the space is much larger. Now it does have the ceilings that are typical of a shopping center, but we are cutting out and doing some um, architectural options to let the light in so that people will be there and really have a feeling of an expansive library. We'll have all of the furniture will be as flexible as we can possibly make it. And we do intend to have a good offering of technology as well. These are again, just some high scale, high end renderings, but this one is gonna be a reality. I do also want to note, again, the external space will look different. We've worked with the Dillonvale uh, ownership to provide options that they are comfortable with. I think this is very exciting. That would allow you to visually have an offset that this is the library. There's a queue here. It looks different from other elements of the mall. 
And we will of course be very attentive to that outside space, giving some landscaping so that there's some distance between the parking and the library. But again, you can see here that we do want to make sure that we're enhancing that external so that people can see the library and it, it becomes a destination right from the moment you see it from the street. Um, when we talk about the timing on that one, we are anticipating having it open um, in the summer of 2021. I've been saying August. Uh, we don't have a set date exactly yet, but you can see on my uh, time frame there where we're at on things. And we are right moving along here where we have had um, the uh, presentation of the community, what we're calling the virtual groundbreaking, so that we are in the construction element of that project right now. We're really excited about it. When it opens, it will be our largest branch library. So that's fantastic. And I can't wait to see that one. And we have lots of information on our webpage. I hope that answers the question about your park. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about those two projects as well. Well, Paul, you just got a two thumbs up from Brad Green who asked that question. So good job. I have a couple of other questions that have come in. One from Deborah Schultz, who's on Zoom today. Will you comment on the parking situation for our wonderful downtown library? Gosh, boy, you know, when we talk about that Walnut Street development, that is one thing that people have been really excited about. If we could have the opportunity to do some kind of parking over there, we know that is a priority. And we are trying really hard to work with the rest of the developers around uh, the area here too, to make sure that our interests are represented. But I, I'll comment in that we, we would love to do something. And again, the current phase is a little bit focused on Vine Street up, but the next phase will take a look at what we might be able to do. And some of the earlier renderings have thought uh, through, or at least proposed that we think through how some of the Walnut Street area might be used for at least a smaller parking lot. Parking garages are expensive, doesn't mean we wouldn't do one, but some of the parking options are fairly pricey, but we understand that that is something that, you know, our customers and honestly our staff also are interested in uh, having us explore further as we can. So I appreciate that question. It's certainly on our radar. Okay. Oh, the plans for the Walnut. I just saw something. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think you have questions. I do. There's a few, a few other questions. And one is actually from Steve King, who's in the room today, but he texted me, which was nice. I feel like I'm at home when that happens. Um, so he said, thank you for your presentation today, Paula. My family loves our Blue Ash Library. We noticed the library expanding into new media, audiobooks, ebooks, et cetera. Could you comment on the future of libraries in the digital age? Sure. Thank you, Steve. And the Blue Ash is one that is very popular library. Um, the pandemic has certainly accelerated people adopting some of those digital formats as well. And what we are seeing currently is there's still an interest in our print. And surprisingly, um, for me, our DVDs remain of interest to folks. So the print and physical material currently is still of interest, but boy, has the digital element expanded. It is certainly um, a different pricing structure for libraries, which we continue to try and work on with our publisher friends. And some of the pandemic addition uh, of people using that format may help us discuss that again with publishers who are concerned about their profit margins in the digital world, where libraries have these copies that we continue to loan. And, I respect their need to have a functional business model, but people are adopting them like uh, nuts. So we really appreciate that and do all that we can. But that is another element around the FMP and why we're making those spaces as flexible as possible. We do continue to have an awful lot of people who want to use the library as an initial stop for experimenting with new technologies, or if they have a small business and they're trying to see if they can make a go of it, using our makerspace to produce initial banners or marketing material as they start to explore that opportunity. We see a heavy use. When we were coming through the pandemic, people continue to really want to use our makerspace to need that space. So we know technology will continue to be something that not only will people want to use more basic technology or everyday technology, they will continue to look for us to provide them the opportunity to experiment with new technologies. And I would also note the gathering space and the collaborative space we know that that is something people have sought uh, even before the coronavirus 
possibly changes the way that people work, but we are already hearing folks who want to just come to the library and work in our small meeting room or come to the library and meet with a client. If the office space changes, people share offices, they're only in office two or three days, they may need to set up a client meeting or need to do a conference call where they need to be someplace that is not their house. And they're talking to the library about how we might be able to provide that collaborative space. So the future of the library, again, kind of tracks toward the way that information changes. People still embrace lifelong learning. They still embrace information, but it is in a different format. And we continue to evolve around that. The key is trying to make it flexible enough so that we're able to build structures that can endure for decades, even if it been as we change them, that we continue to evolve with people's information and learning needs. And of course, never mind uh, that we could do another presentation on exactly what learning for young folks might be on the other side of some of the changes as remote learning alters the landscape around education and the kind of access to various materials or teachers that uh, young folks might have. Very good. And I have uh, I think we have time for two more questions, and I have two, one from Zoom, a member on Zoom and one from a member here in the room. Uh, this is from Cheryl Parker, who's on Zoom today. How accessible will the branches be to the public this summer with COVID reopenings beginning to occur? And is there a role the library can play for students who need academic enrichment more than ever? Yes and yes. So the library here in Cincinnati, we have focused on in-building service and have done our, um, our darndest. We've been open for in-building service since July, but the question is a, a very good one. And we were, we're already trying to evolve as uh, things get more open and coronavirus, you know, I feel very optimistic that we're gonna continue on a positive tra trajectory. So yes, we know the summer with the longer days and people wanting to be out feeling more comfortable. So I would definitely say we're already trying to plan um, for uh, what we may be looking at, particularly in June forward. If the, if the current trajectory continues, you know, we will begin to roll things back uh, in terms of restrictions. And again, the hours, while we have hours across the system, um, we don't have evening hours right now. So those kinds of things we anticipate in June and in early summer, if not June, you know, right as we move through the summer, they'll be more important. In terms of the learning, we are working very closely with the schools and trying to really understand and listen to what it is we can do to support young people. We know there's a lot of work there. We know it's academic and social emotional, and we are part of that equation. I meet regularly with um, leaders from across the county who are in, in, in the informal education space. So the YMCA, as well as the Cincinnati Rec Center, even the museums, and the zoo, we're all working on that. I will say that we have a, currently, we were the recipients of a very large uh, grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Science and uh, Services in conjunction with the Cincinnati Museum Center, where we are working with them to bring their content into a remote environment that I think will be a great benefit to students and younger learners after the pandemic. So it's forced some museums and uh, us to really think about how can we, export that fantastic content to people who may not be able to come to the museum and how do we support learning in that space as well. So we are working on that. I think it's a really important question and we continue to try and listen as everyone learns in that space what is needed. But you know, nobody cares more about young people than the library. Uh, we, we do that and um, we really can't wait to figure out how to get back to story time and some of those basic services as well. And uh, one last question from uh, Bob McElroy in the room. He says, I'm a big fan of the library and regular at the Anderson branch. I had a small part in the movie, The Public with my good friend, Emilio Estevez. And wonder if you still have an issue with the homeless wanting to stay in the library at night. We, um, you know, we serve all kinds of audiences. And the thing that I will say is, we, even before the pandemic, and I do believe after the pandemic, we have tried very hard to connect with other civic and nonprofit institutions to give people the help that they need. We also have, um, we have hired, we had hired a social worker. Uh, that person has moved on from the library, but we have that position out there again. 
And we currently are working with someone in a part-time role as a resource navigator. I say that because what we're trying to do is build relationships with people who may be at the library who uh, seek help or maybe at some point may seek help, such as, you know, if they are in transitional housing or looking for some option there, how we can build that relationship to have the trust and connect them with the resources that, that they may need. So we are well aware of having a variety of folks who need different resources, but sometimes we're the only place that people can connect or feel comfortable. Because at the library, as you all know, when you come in, you know what, what we ask is how can we help you? And we really don't have a lot of other requirements for engaging with the services that the library has outside of some basic behavior requirements. So it is some places really accessible. And I do hope that some of these designs you see at the main library will allow us to have spaces where those nonprofits and those folks who really can help people connect can come in regularly and talk uh, to people, build a relationship so that we can get them connected with the resources that work for them. That's great. Um, Paula, thank you so much for your time and for all the helpful answers today. We really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Hope to talk to you again soon and see you all at the library. And don't sign off yet. Don't sign off yet. Because uh, we want to say that in our appreciation of you speaking to our Rotary Club today, we are going to make a donation in your honor to Rotary International's End Polio Now campaign which has been going on for about 35 years. Uh, we really do care about our community here in Cincinnati, just as you do. We care about the international community that we're all a part of as well. So thank you again for that, for coming. That is wonderful. Thank you. I, I deeply appreciate that. I, and I, hopefully I'll be able to come back and talk to you again. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And just a, a word, I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined in person today. Thanks to everybody who joined on Zoom today. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Next week's meeting, just a reminder, it's Justice Pat DeWine from the Supreme Court of Ohio. Please join us next Thursday. And in the meantime, have a great weekend meeting adjourned.